Hi, I've taken over Ian's stream. Uh, he should be on in a minute, though. Maybe. But until then, you get to deal with me, Allison. Uh, hope everybody's having a great night. I'm working on a page for my book. Got the base roughs. No, oh, Ian's here. Uh, what did was to the right side. Well, you know, we switched sides. We did. We did. Yeah. Uh, oh. Let's see. It's been crazy. The last uh, couple of streams, like I would say about a half hour in, I would get like a wave of a bunch of people that just popped in. I always wonder how like the algorithm works that gets people to see, you know, where it's at or pe when people are done with dinner or what it is. I don't know. Hmm. Actually, Do you get that on your show where like you'll just randomly have like a chunk of people come in and out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get yeah. I get a bunch of weird stuff like that that just kind of happens. Um, so, yeah, I completely right. understand that. Maybe you show up on a search or something. Who knows? Yep. All right. I just took my mug off the thing because uh, it's not really showing up in there. So nobody really wants to see my face anyway. I got, you know, they want to see the artwork. Hey, Jonathan is here. He says, hello, Allison and Ian. Okay. Yep, two for night. We're causing trouble. Oh, there we go. That way you don't have my signature floating above your, your thingy. So I just oh, that worked. swapped it. Oh, yeah, that worked. So let's see what we got going here. Oh, yeah. Just uh, welcome to everybody, Jonathan. Thanks for coming in. We just had a few more people pop in. Um, I'm going to be working on another Planet Comics sketch cover for my buddy Jeff. I'll um, show off just that page that I posted a progress shot of for the folks that are just here for the Undersea Hero Kickstarter update. Oh, fantastic uh, stuff. Yeah, this page, um, for people that don't know, the correlator's vessel is designed to look like an anglerfish. They're a deep sea fish. And mm -hmm. with anglerfish, the male and the female of the species are drastically of different size. The male is oh. like this tiny little minnow, and the female is the one that you picture when you see an anglerfish. So like the little escape pod slash like, um, I don't know, mini craft that it, there is, yeah. is actually like the little male where it's attached mm -hmm. to it. And, That's really uh, cool. I like that. It's it's one of those references to science that I don't expect anyone to necessarily get, but it's uh it's it's fun. Um, and then Jan and Colonel Feathers are heading out on their side mission, and uh, the setup on this page is is uh, how are, how is Correlator not going to know that we're gone? And then we'll we'll reveal that on the next page. Um, nice. But yeah, that's where I'm at. We did finish the other page, page 18. That's 19. I suspect 20 will be on its way in a day or so. So we are we're moving right along. So enough about me chattering. Uh, what have you got going on? Let's see. I'm working on my book here. Uh, well, and that was, and I, I'm sorry, that was a lame uh, introduction. Uh, this is my Let's friend see. Allison, who has been on yeah. our show before, and we're lucky to have her back tonight. And she's done tons of excellent comics and artwork and she knows more about uh, anime and manga and is a very very well what's the right word um beyond adept beyond well-read comics expert so yeah i i don't think i have the knowledge you do um with comics but i definitely know my crap i would say um i mean Absolutely. i'm a dollar bin diver like you are so my favorite age is like the bronze age so yeah so it's a good age where, because that was those were the books that you know for most of our lives we've been able to get them for you know anywhere from 50 Nothing. cents to two dollars yep that's how i got my first appearance of iron fist i barely paid a thing for it oh wow nice uh hmm. but yeah so this is basically some of the stuff that i'm doing this is uh uh page one of my book and this is actually like page four that i'm showing off i just wanted to draw the splash page to kind of go with it and that uh, truck came out of dynamite so i really tough appreciate to draw. that it's a that tough thing to draw it took me forever to do just just saying it took me absolutely forever to draw so 
And that's the kind of stuff artists will go back and forth on. Like there was one time I had a piece where a fellow artist just wrote back to be like, man, that was, that was a good foot that you drew there. You know, it's, it's not like we're saying that the whole piece isn't great, but like one of the, when we see those hard things being done well. One of my covers I did, um, Dave Finch goes, that pose is amazing because it's almost impossible to draw. <laughs> that's, that's high praise. Yeah, he loved the way I had specifically the foot in it. The foot? Yep, the that's, foot. That's, it's one of those things that separates the pros. <sighs> yeah, so these are some of the character stuff that'll be appearing in the book and things. That's actually a D&D &D character I drew. But... <clears throat> So that's some of the stuff I've been working on. I did not do a thumbnail today, so I'm working my way through the shapes first, and I got ahead of myself. So I'm going to just erase that and then block out where my composition will be. Yeah, I got my mini notebook here where I do a lot of my thumbnails. So I've met so many people lately that tell me they don't even do a thumbnail. They just go straight into it, and I, I don't know. I, I haven't gotten to that brain space yet. Well, I I don't know too many who really are in that brain space. I mean, I know um, I know Dave um, specifically does thumbnails. I've watched him do it. Actually, he did it on my um, my live stream actually back in August when I had him on. He uh, thumbnailed out one of my characters and then drew it. So I watched that stream and. and um... If you want to drop a link or if people want to go to your page, where would they, they find said stream? It is on my um, YouTube channel, which is just my name, Allison McGlone. Um, and uh, if you go there, it's uh, one of the last streams I've done on YouTube. So um, I've been, I have multiple sclerosis and it's been kind of hitting me hard lately. Uh, so I haven't been able to stream as much as I want, but I am doing it. Well, it's Wonder Dane. How's it going? Hmm. Oh, I think that's oh, from that, my that, that showed up on my end too. I can see that. Look at that. That's yep, that's when it's awesome. good to have a tech wizard on the uh, on the stream with you. They know they know how to make things go. I fake it till I make it. <sighs> so, what was it like when you were seeing an artist whose work you've liked so long with, with Dave drawing one of your characters? Was it just a, a, a incredible like just taking it in or were you like maybe like oh maybe i'll try drawing it a little more like that or was it just seeing like the nuts and bolts like what was what was that like actually it's kind of funny because i adjusted my style a bit based on how he did it um i mean i've always had a fairly stylized look but i started to add a little bit more realism to it um after he drew my character i think it's one of the reasons why that truck came out very realistic looking yeah um but, oh yeah wonder danes is a big fan of both of us so that's even cooler thank you dane uh but yeah so that that was um that was very exciting there's also a way that he drew fists that like i've i've seen artists draw them the way he did before the way he did it but i just started doing it more like that No, I did not forget. I knew it was Rick. Because huh. you're like one of the only Danes I know. So. Oh, is this uh, Rick from... Oh, it's a different Rick. I was thinking no, it was maybe Rick. the Rick we both knew from the uh, the round table. Nope, no, this is um, Rick Brulu. He's uh, literally is a Dane. It's, okay. Uh, I ran D&D &D for him and stuff. He's also quite an adept artist himself. Oh, wow. Very good. Had him on my show too, so I don't know if I I'm think. the best Dane. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I've been thinking about actually doing uh, like a lot more traditional stuff with this book. Like you know, I I rough everything out um, pretty quickly, um, just to try to get like some basic silhouettes in, and then kind of you know. Give it a little bit of minor details so I know where I'm going, but I've been thinking about doing um like all my gray tones and all that by hand. Are you gonna maybe are you thinking about doing it with wash or marker? Or? 
I was thinking a little bit of Copic and some wash. I was also debating on possibly giving it a little bit of a gouache uh, hit in some places. Oh, okay. I haven't really decided. I was going to do a couple of tests and see what I wanted to do. And I've worked with um, Blank and Comic Cast. Uh, is either of those rings a bellion? Comic Cast is pretty Comics cool. Comic Cast sounds familiar, yes. Yeah, Comic Cast is a pretty cool thing. I apologize. I uh, had, a, had a long day today. Oh, I get it. I get it completely. But I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be doing this. I'm glad you're here. It's all I'm good things. Here. Usually I play D&D tonight, but um, uh, my game got canceled. And I was just like, my game's canceled. I have to hit up Ian. <laughs> so, Anytime you're free, you're always welcome. That was very cool. I love hanging out with you. Likewise. That's so I was thinking about going up to New Hampshire in a couple of weeks anyway, but um, I figured if you were up there, I could, you know, sit with you or something for a little bit. Yeah, I'm just yeah. still figuring out how I get, how I'm getting there. <laughs> well, if you need a ride, I could probably arrange it. So, I, I will let you know. We are still. I, I'm I'm just behind because I actually just finished like that one thing that takes artists forever and small business people. Uh, I just finished my taxes, taxes for last year um, this past weekend, and I'd been working on those. Like, you know, you make it sure you got all your receipts and you got everything lined up. So, um, yeah, I had a fun year with those um, a couple of years ago. With um, I worked with a couple of companies I can't talk about. So, ah. <laughs> uh, just pack a backpack and walk. America's not that big after all, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it, Rick. If I had to, if I had to take public transportation, it would be a bus from near where I live, which I don't generally mention, and it would be taking that to Boston and then a bus up to Concord. And honestly, the the venue isn't far from where the bus station is in Concord, but um, well, it's just figuring you. out um, timing Legit. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got you. Yeah, I don't think that this pose works. It's too stiff. So we're going to twist it a little bit. Again, this is what happens when you don't have a thumbnail. I spent my lunch break. I should have been doing a thumbnail for this. I spent my lunch break drawing the, uh, the Hercules uh, announcement sketch. Oh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was just a quick little thing. I, I bought, I, I mentioned on the thing, I bought a stack of uh, Charlton Hercules from uh, the last show that uh, Jonathan and I were actually at. And um, Sam Glanzen's more known for doing his like war comics over at DC. Mm -hmm. But he did a stack of these and he did Tarzan and a few other things. And um, let's see, I knew him from Tarzan. So, yeah. yeah. And you can see the way he stylized drawing Hercules's face was like the side of, you know, like an urn or something, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, and then he did these crazy cool, like in between panels, like these like fake Grecian uh, geometric shapes yeah. and, you cool. know, and the just cool hand lettering. You know, I, I love that it's not super clean. Um but it's all intentional and you can see all the knowledge there and you can see like, here's like another angle of a face that is straight off of like Greek pottery. Um, and of course, Charlton being Charlton, like they didn't have letterers. They didn't have any of that. He was just, this is a hundred percent Glansman and Joe Gill. And like, yeah, that makes sense. But then you get these killer backups that are Thane of Begarth, which are done by a young Jim Aparo. Oh, you can just cool. see like Very cool. how awesome the artwork is in those. Oh, we got more people popping in. Wonder Dane yeah. asks, so Ian, of all the heroes in the world to be inspired of to create your own character, why Aquaman? Well, it was a it was a combination of things, really. Um, you know, when I was younger, I worked uh, at an aquarium. I was big into oceanography and comics. So, like, those two things together seemed to make sense to me as far as being into, like, that stuff. But, like, when you look at Undersea Hero, it's much more absurd. It's much more in the, the vein of, like, 
you know, at the time I was reading Tick Comics and reading Megaton Man and reading all of these books that not only were they satire, but they also were able to give commentary on comics as a whole and different storytelling methods and things like that. Like you just look at those early issues that Edlin did yeah. and you have references to hop or, or fine artists and all kinds of things. And oh, God, yeah. I mean, he did the whole um, Nighthawks piece in there. Yep. Yep. And it just changed. I think that if you want, it's tough to get people to pick up an indie comic, especially an indie superhero comic. And in my experience, or at least from me. So I'm not going to project on anyone else. So when I've done other superhero books, and if I want to actually say something about that genre with this piece of work, I think that going the direction with some satire and some humor is a way to get people to at least gain entry uh, by feeling you know, that there's going to be some payoff to being in on the knowledge that we've all been amassing from reading all these books for years. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So, like, I really, I came up with the character just one summer, just goofing off, and I did a piece that's actually in issue zero. I don't know if I have any. Do I have any for it going on right here? Uh, I do. I got one. Right here. Yeah. Okay. Which I did in college. Um, um, and I actually did it for a class back in 2004. Um, and you can see, like, it's it's crude. You can see where I was really fighting the anatomy. Um, I was more impressed that, with myself that I was inking it with a brush than actually, like, knowing how to ink with a brush. So um, it was... Yeah, inking with a brush can be hard, but I prefer it. So. Yeah. No, and it's, it's something that I'm proud that I've gotten better at over the years, so... Uh. We got um, uh, Cartoon Jack. Oh, haven't seen me at BCR in a long time. I've been up to working on lately. Yeah, I've been um, busy on Thursday nights, unfortunately. Uh, I do like checking in on occasion there, but I have a combination of a couple of things that come up. Like, last week proved to be date night, and the boyfriend went out. So, uh, I think that's fair. Yeah, so he went out, and um, I was a lot happier. So, um, so that was a thing. Uh, right now I'm working on my, I don't really know how to describe it, but my weird idea book. <clears throat> Has supernatural aspect to things. And also probably a wuxia kind of feel to it. And some urban legend stuff. Very cool. That's one of the things I'm going to do after Undersea Hero is going to be the longest single piece I've done. And I'm going to do a bunch of shorts afterwards because I just have all these ideas I want to get out real quick before I dive into anything else big. Like uh, when are you going back to Helena? I'm thinking that that would be it. like the first big thing after I pump out about five or six shorts, you know, and mm. I've got a couple of people asking me that want to collaborate on stuff. And I'm like, well, it's going to have to wait till um, Undersea Heroes done. And, you know, like these Planet Comics sketch covers are just from before, like the Kickstarter, my Kickstarter got started. So I'm just trying to clear the last of what's on my deck. Um, I have to get, um, when your uh, book comes out, I need to get some uh, blank covers of it if you if you got them. Yeah, I have some of zero, and I'm going to probably print some more. I'm not going to print um, sketch covers of one just because it's going to be like 60 pages, and those would be oh, really like, yeah. expensive and stuff. So like people can ha get copies of one, and then there's also the blank for zero. So. Hmm. Oh, this Mike DeFont has shown up. How's it going, Michael? Hey, Mike. Mike is a... Very welcome regular, who's always sharing some of his artwork and his knowledge. Yeah, he just had a big review from uh, Bernard Chang, I believe, the other day. Oh, wow. Terrific artist. Yes, yes, he is. Yeah, Mike's cultivated quite the friendship with him, from what I can tell. 
seems like a really nice guy. I, I met him only once when he came to Boston years ago. Um, it was a long time ago. I was going to say, that was a really long time ago. I was thinking about it. That was 10 years or so? Yeah, it was the old Boston Comic Con. Yeah, so it, was, it, was, it, was, yeah it was before it was at the um, Heinz or whatnot. Yeah. When it was more comics. That's true. It was actually a Comic Con. It was weird. But the yeah. guys, the, 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 the folks at Fan Expo were very nice to me. So I honestly, I can't... Uh, I can't complain about my experience uh, there last year at all. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not complaining about them. I just like more comic cons than. I mean, Fan Expo isn't trying to be a comic con, so. Yeah, they have tons of. They, they try to appeal to all the people, so you know. Yeah, but I can't criticize them or anything like that. That's what they're trying to do, and they succeeded. That's it's literally that is what they're doing. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Although I didn't sign up really for any, and I didn't request any spots really this year. So um, really, ju really just trying to nail down getting Undersea Hero done as, as on time or on time as possible. That's fair. That's completely And, and I still feel guilty when people reach out to me for stuff and it's like, ah, I can't do it. I'm sorry. But I, I just don't think it would be a, I don't think it would be good if I was like no, running if around. And, your, if you're working on your Kickstarter stuff, it kind of makes sense. Yep. You just want to get your stuff done and kind of go from there. Uh, I'm actually terrified to do a Kickstarter, so. You know me, I have been my whole life. So this is like very stressful for me. I'm like, oh, I got to go home and work on these things. I have constituents oh, yeah. to justify my time to. Yep. Although yeah. I will say it has kept me pretty daggone motivated. You know, it's not one of those where sometimes, and I admit this, like when I was working on my own stuff, I would put it aside too easily for like a uh, a paid job yeah even if it was a small one yeah no i hear that so it has it definitely has helped me you know lock it down um the same thing happened with iron face i remember when i did iron face and they were talking about i was asking like hey can we have a little more time for me to try to get some more pages done and they were like nope we're gonna do this and we we trust you to deliver it and everything else and i was like Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, that pose is working pretty good. Yeah, it's got a little more bend to it, but it's not. She doesn't, I don't know. I, one of the things that I hold dear to my heart was a critique from my co one of my college drawing professors. And she told me that um, I drew tough women that she wouldn't want to necessarily meet in a dark alley. And <laughs> I, I have worn that as a badge of honor uh, ever since, and I try to maintain that. That's fantastic. You got the bit of the clickiness going, though. The sound? Yeah. All right, I'll try to do that little reset thing. I'll be popping out in the back. I'll be here controlling the stream. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, Cartoonist Jack, I published my first book, by the way. I'll, yep, excellent. I'd love to hear my feedback at some point when I have the time. I've also been debating whether or not to use Kickstarter and or Patreon to help build a following. I definitely think both of those would work. Um, is it, I've used um, Patreon a bit um, for my... Like, I actually have a comic up on it that's called... Um, I can't remember the name of my own comic. Oh, uh, <laughs> That's, that's not good, Allison. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not good. Third type zero. Um, and it's my my take on the um, Sentai genre of stuff, it's kind of like Power Rangers and things like that. And um, I basically took the idea of a Power Rangers story and going, well, what are what what basically makes these Power Ranger stories a thing? And I'm like, well, they're basically a bunch of kids that have been pressed into fighting a war. And I'm like, that's terrifying. And I just went with that. Like, it's uh, it's pretty dark. Child soldiers is a very dark concept. So. Yeah, especially when you break it down to that simplest form. Sometimes it doesn't set in until you know you're like, oh, oh, it's that. Yep. So I just remember the first Power Ranger show, which I, I never really watched it. I was a bit too old when it came out. 
Uh, and plus, I had other things to watch, like the Disney Afternoon and Batman the Animated Series. But anyway, so um, when I saw it, though, and I was just like, you know, teens with attitude or something like that is what they had said on it. And I was just like, oh, oh, I, I, I see where this is going. And I kind of went back and thought about that. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that's dark. Over the years, I, I ran into many of the Rangers in my convention travels. So, yeah, I've bumped uh, into a few of them. I met the Green Ranger before he passed away. I I did as well, mm -hmm. um, but I would say the most interesting story involving the Green Ranger had to do with someone who you might have actually even been at that show was when we had like a, a just married couple. Who like were on their oh, honeymoon at yep at, at the comic show. And I remember just, that one. Yeah, that was good. And they were just like so elated having met him that they were both just crying and holding each other, and it was like this this happy moment for them. And and, and honestly, that was far more memorable than than for me because I was like you, not necessarily a fan of the show. Yeah, just seeing that effect that that show had on people um, was far more memorable for me. Yeah, no, I agree with you. That was uh, that was a big thing. And we got. Um, I thought you were there. I thought you were there for yeah. that one. Yeah, I was at that one. Then I was at the, I was at the one when like, uh, is it Ralph Macchio's um, agent or something like that? Like, uh, insulted RoboCop or tried to pick a fight with like Peter Weller. Is that his name? He played RoboCop. Peter Weller. Yeah, he was he was there at one point. Yeah, yeah I, he was there. I, it was in Rhode Island when something like that, and there's something like that, something weird happened with like Ralph Macchio's agent and him or something. One of the Rhode Islands we were at. Don't mess with Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, just see, that's know. what I knew him from. Like, I know, I know RoboCop is infinitely more like well known, but I, I, oh, I saw Banzai. that as a kid, you know. Yeah, no, I'm the same way. Buckaroo Banzai is kind of there. Uh, he's also the voice of Batman: The Dark Knight Returns. Oh. Chad's here. Hey, Chad. Hey. And uh, at this oh, so Mike's talking a bit about his critique from Bernard. He's a great teacher because uh, he critiques without discouraging you. That that is a good thing because I had a critique from Neil Adams once. Once, <laughs> once was enough. <laughs> yeah, wasn't even asking for it, but boy, did I get it. I actually felt more motivated seeing. Um, what I need to work on. That's really cool. And Mike says I'm good at figuring out what co what's causing audio issues. He's actually right. That's one of the things I'm probably best at with editing is um, audio. Um, Batman the Animated Series, one of my all-time favorite shows. Love that Bruce Timm style. Yeah, I love it too, because it has this weird kind of Kirby S-ness to it, and that's different at the same time. It's like Kirby and like Doug Wildey had a baby. Yeah. That's it, Doug Wieldy. It's perfect. We got a Peter Weller rules. Buckaroo Banzai is my dad's favorite corny movie. <laughs> it's like everybody's favorite corny movie. It's awesome. Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah, exactly. It's just about the type of voice of Batman, and kind of the original Super Mario movie is one of my favorite corny movies. That's a that is a really corny movie. That's kind of fun. I watched the thing that Secret Galaxy did on that, and that movie was going to be much much more darker. I have to say. I kind of wish they went with that. Well, and, and of course, because like we grew up in the era when those games were like brand new or close to new, um, we had to see that movie. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I stand by that Mortal Kombat is a great movie. The original one from like 1995 or 94 or whatever it was. I love that movie, especially the soundtrack. I, I will say that the second one I have used for years is an example of like the worst movie. I can completely agree with that. Cause the second one I fell asleep during. Cause it was, it was the fact that it began with the move. The first one, spoiler alert ends with a freeze frame of like all the major characters, like in the video game and the new one, the second one at the time, new at the time starts with the same shot, but like half of them are different actors. <laughs> yep. And then it just, at that point, you're like, okay, 
thorough is not how I would describe this production. Uh, no. But the KM, KMFDM doing the theme song was just great. But yeah, no, the second one was just god-awful. So if you haven't seen it, we've seen it, so you don't have to. That's right. That's right. And we saw it because if you saw, like, 80s action movies, this was probably, what, 93, 94? Yeah, it, it was shortly after the original one came out, which is, yeah, around that same time period. Yeah. They, like, cranked it out as soon as possible in order to capitalize on the first one and the song being so popular and everything. Yep. I've been really working on, and this, again, artist minutia, eye sockets and cheekbones. Really, really been working on that lately. Well, that definitely works. I mean, my eyes are kind of manga s, so I, they're kind of, you know, more cartoony. So I don't really work on eye sockets. Sometimes I go with cheeks, though, and I kind of try to push them in certain ways. Yeah. You can make a good female face if you get the cheekbone right. That's right. It's, and and it can absolutely obliterate it as well. Oh, yeah. Now, looking at um, Basema is a good person I like to look at when creating a female face. And uh, also, um, well, Mike Turner. See, Mike was so stylized, and I could see that for, for your stuff for sure, because he was, like, synthesizing similar influences that you had. Yeah. But, I, but I always found for like a three to trying to make it like my brain sadly works and it, it was a problem with the tick. Um, I have to know what it the shape it is. And in order to try to th like overthink my way through it. Mm, and, okay. And um, not to say that Mike's work wasn't aesthetically beautiful or, or good or anything like that. It was, it was all those things. Mm -hmm. um, but there were times where I couldn't figure out the shape of the skull underneath it. Yeah, no, that I can actually see that. Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. And it was the way he would exaggerate. And he and these were things he did intentionally. So it's not like, you know, I'm accusing him of not knowing his stuff or anything. Yeah. Um, my one trick to drawing suggestion for draw, people who are drawing to draw the retro... Frazetta Space Ladies um, specifically, and actually some like retro space guys too, like Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. Don't draw them so tall. Don't give them the superhero height. No, give them more of a, a like a like a standard height. The the head number of heads tall should not be like twelve, like with you know Martian no, Manhunter or whatever. Eight. I'll um, go maybe nine at the most. Mine's like seven and a half here. Yeah, let's see. So. But the character also looked short in the, the, the pictures. I'm drawing a character mm -hmm. I've never heard of named Hilly Rose for this uh, Kickstarter reward. So we're learning as we go. Hey, that works. Uh, I actually have to do some um, Frazetta. I'm working on a Frazetta S piece for um, someone. He wants some basically kind of sketches done a little bit in that style. And uh, I can mimic Frazetta about as good as anyone, you know, anyone else can really without calling myself Simon Bisley or whatnot. So, um, but that that's a stretch for me at times doing it because he's very realistic with his rendering. Well, and Simon, um, I'm sure you've seen it. He actually finished, like took an old Frazetta painting for Danzig and like refinished it for one of those Jaguar God comics. Yep. And... It was funny, like, I remember Frank um, talking about it at one point in a documentary um, that he thought that Simon was super talented and did beautiful work, but he just didn't like all of the exaggerations that Simon would put into everything. So Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did some initial sketches. He's he's like, she's a bit too curvy. I'm like, you wanted Frazetta. <laughs> He did some slim athletic characters, but it was more when he was doing like the Valkyrie sci-fi stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anytime he was drawing a character for himself, they, you know, they had um, they had a strong resemblance to Mrs. Frazetta. Yep, that's very true. And Ellie was and... a sweet, 
nice lady. Yeah, she was. I met Frazetta at the at his museum years ago. It was pretty cool. Yeah. I didn't get to talk to him for very long or anything, but you know, it was neat. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the wife was there too, Ellie. She was there. That is very cool. I got to ask him about the Star Wars stuff that he was uh that Lucas was trying to get him to do, so because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. That's and... not a surprise with your Star Wars. Yeah. Hmm. My Star Wars obsessions and things. The fact they own an actual lightsaber used in the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> your Star Wars super fandom. Yeah. Would you say you're more into Star Wars than comics? No, it's actually kind of tough. Um, because in some ways I'd say about the same. There's certain certain comics that I just love. Like, the original Ninja Turtles means so much to me. Um, I absolutely love the or the original like first ten to 15, no, about ten to twelve issues of Ninja Turtles. The original Mirage. Yeah, the original run. The original, yeah, original Mirage Studio ones. Um, and I liked Return of the Shredder a lot. Uh, I thought those were great, and City at War I thought was good. Um, the ending story, basically all the ones that Eastman and Laird actually worked on together, even though they didn't fully work on City of War together because things I don't know. Um, but those mean like as much to me as the original Star Wars trilogy does. And the Burn uh, Claremont run of X Men. I also liked the the return with uh, when it was just called TMNT in like the early two thousands. Yeah, that was a good one too. And it's because Peter was steering the ship on those. Yeah, those are fun. I mean, I met both Eastman and Laird a couple of times. I have their signatures on Turtles One. Very cool. I do Turtle. not have. I do not have a Turtles One. The Turtles one I lucked into, I was actually at the show where it debuted. Oh, wow. Uh, and I ended up with a couple of copies of it. And I think that's actually probably one of the reasons why Turtles hold so much a place in my heart is because I met them when the book was brand new. That's a huge, That's a, I mean, that's a huge thing because you, you got to like be there at the start and enjoy the, the journey with them. Yeah. And I mean, I even love the original cartoon and everything. It's cheesy, but this is one of the things I love about it. Yes, I definitely, my brother and I definitely watch the cartoons. Hmm. Yeah, I watch the cartoons, so it's like, it was great. I remember when um when the advertisement for it, I remember there was a kid next door to me. He's just like, this thing looks dumb. And I'm like, no, 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 it'll be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And um, he watched it. And like the next day, he's like, that thing was amazing. Like, this is the first episode of it. And I'm like, yeah. Um, we're like addicted to the show I'm like and i showed him the original comics and he's just like this is a lot more violent and i'm like yes yes yeah. it is this is a lot weirder i need an adult yeah i think i was like in fourth or fifth grade or something when that came out it's like 87 i think 86 yeah 86 so yeah i was 10 yeah yeah, the comic came out in 84. Yep. yep. So, yeah, and that was like a couple of years later it came out. So yeah. so, yeah. So I was like around 9 or 10 when the original show came out. So I think I'm a couple of years older than you. Uh, you were 10 in 86? Yeah. I I turned was, 10. I was 20. 2. You were 2. So, yep. Yeah, I'm definitely older. Uh, but not far off. Not no, far. not that far off. I mean, um, my sister was born in 82, so. Yeah, so my brother was, yep. <sighs> my uh, my mother saw uh, um, my drawing some Ninja Turtles comics as uh, validation for having to pick up Ninja Turtles toys when I was a child. <laughs> uh, I used to draw the Ninja Turtle toys. They were cool. It was they a were. cool line. It got out of control, like where they were doing like, you know, sports and Star Trek crossovers and all kinds of stuff. And then Jim Lee got his hands on them over at Image. And 
Yep. I have honestly never read those comic books. I've only the only Image Turtles I've read was the stuff that Frank Fosco mm -hmm. did with Eric Larson and the the um, uh, Savage Dragon crossovers. I never read any of like the Jim Lee stuff. Yeah, I read the I read the Eric Larson stuff, uh, and I read um, uh, Trent Kananuga's Creech and um, or not Creech uh, Creed. Creed and Ninja Turtles thing that he did. That's right. They did that one off. I forgot about that. Yep. He, actually, when he was out at San Diego, I guess there's a whole thing where um, he was selling the original pages to fund his trip to San Diego uh, at San Diego Comic Con. Hey, desperate times, man. Oh yeah. Well, hell, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing more like traditional stuff is you can sell the originals and make money. Hopefully. In this state, they make you pay taxes on that stuff. Yeah, they say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kevin Eastman came up with a TMNT, right? Um, do you mean the the Jim Lee one? The TMNT one? No, the the sequel series? I thought that was Eric Larson that was at the helm of that. Uh, uh, Kevin Eastman did the first sketch. And yeah, then, he did the first sketch, which became... Peter did his art, version, basically. Right after it. Yeah. But yeah, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. And for those that don't know why it's called Mirage Studios, it's because there was no studio. It was their yeah, kitchen was, table. Yep, and a couple of art boards. And, and was uh, Kevin was working at a lobster restaurant. Yep. Yeah, they put the first issue out, and then um, they had to borrow money from like Eastman's uncle or something. Yeah, that was the one. first one. And then... Yeah. Um, when two, they got enough orders with, for one to put two out, and they put three, and then they put it out four, and there's this myth that immediately it was like they they were just swimming in money, like they were doing enough to to live. Yeah. But there was kind of a gap between the books and the toys because the toys yeah. were part of the push the show, and um, actually it was NEC that bought the warehouse worth of stuff that was still there. And that's why they forever had minty fresh vintage TMNT comics at all the NEC stores. Yep. Yeah. The only one that was hard to get of the original run is, um, is one like to really hunt it down. One's the hardest because there was only 3000 copies published and, um, they sold out very, very quickly. And then a bunch of, there were a bunch of counterfeits made. Oh yeah. Um, and there, there's places online where you can see where they tell you why um, or how you can determine which ones are fakes. Mm -hmm. Part of it is, um, I want to say the gobbledygook act, uh, ad in the back is often wrong or something, is one of them. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the actual issues, so I don't really pull them out very often. Uh, you take it out and you read it while you're cooking dinner, you know. Exactly. You know, <laughs> Just throw Making it on the pasta. kitchen table. Yeah. have to hope i don't because right now because i don't know this character so well i'm i'm with the line art it's getting a little stiff i'm gonna have to probably try to ink it quick so that it gets some life back into it that's fair because i'm like second guessing the design throughout this whole thing i have to keep looking back and looking back yeah, that sucks when you have to do that because you do get stiffer on your art when you're constantly referencing things like that. Like it's one of the reasons I was drawing that truck. I'm like, I don't care if it looks a little stiff. It stopped. <laughs> That's right. That was a smart move right there. So you didn't have to have the wheels like slightly off the ground or anything. Yep. And I drew it moving from the top. And I'm like, it's a rectangle with the square on top of it. Then I'll shade it right so it looks more like a truck. Uh. Uh, that's the other fun thing. Shape design. If anyone really wants to know the secret to drawing comics, it's all about shape design. <laughs> shape design and silhouettes. 
Yeah, and shape design is a, an aspect of just your your composition and mm -hmm. silo, and those are just your building blocks. Yep. So, my friend Rob uh, often will compliment people on like their shape design and layouts for their construction. Um, it's what he loves to point to for everything. Uh, Rob Dunas of Sketchcraft. Cool. He loves pointing that stuff out. Super cool guy. Don't know if I've met Rob, so. Oh. He was, um, I really got into a lot of his work about, I mean, I've always liked his stuff when I saw it online and stuff like that, just like coming across it. But I actually reached out to him because he, when I was in the hospital, literally six years ago today is when I was diagnosed with MS. Um, and um, his little stupid 60 second videos were making me laugh. And they really helped me out when I was in the hospital. So I reached out to him and I just thanked him for putting me through a lot because of with my diagnosis of MS and everything. And he was just like, oh, cool. And uh, we've been kind of corresponding and been friends with since. Been on a few of his live stream shows. He's been on a few of mine. See, and that's lovely. I think I actually have seen him on your show. Yeah, when uh, the new Spider-Verse movie came out, he was actually on that the show that day. Um, Spider Verse movie it. might actually be my favorite superhero movies. I still haven't seen it. Still haven't they're good. It. I've heard they're, they're good. good. It's just I don't I don't have the Disney Pluses. Yeah, I don't know if they're even on Disney Plus. I just assume anything Marvel related is on the yeah, Disney Plus. They're Sony, so it's a little weird. Yeah. And they're actually Sony Spider-Man stuff that's good. As I'll put it, I've seen Madam Web, so you don't have to. Didn't see that. And I'll be honest, I haven't seen more than about 20 minutes of one of the Andrew Garfield Spider-Mans. That's fine. I've seen them, so you don't have to. I saw all the Toby ones in the theater. Yeah, I did too. I enjoyed all Toby ones too, in some way or another. The third one was the weakest, but you know. It's still yeah. stuff I liked about it. Jonathan's claiming that they're on Netflix, so I do have oh, okay. Netflix. Yeah, I think they are actually. I think Jonathan's right. The Creech is a monster in monster trucks. Okay, we can go with that. I have no idea. Creech is also the character that um Greg Capullo came up with. The Creech. Yeah, they did like a mini series and all kinds he of has, stuff. Yeah, it's two mini series of it. It's really good, and he's gonna be doing a new one. Well, they got him drawing, drawing the X-Men's now. Yep. That I'm kind of enjoying. I like his art a lot. He's really changed since he was on, um, like, X-Force and things. Yeah. I, uh, when he was at Boston, before, right before the new 52 Batman came out, he was, like, giving away free prints. And mm. um, I brought an old issue of, um, it wasn't Marvel Comics Presents. They also did a an antho big anthology series just called Marvel Superheroes. I remember that one. And he did a couple of shorts in one. And so did a young Amanda Connor and stuff Ooh, like that. Very I like, cool. Yeah, I like bringing those types of books that are early on in people's careers, especially, you know, just it's one of those things that always prompts more conversation than just whatever, you know, they're they're most known for usually, or they've seen 10,000 times. So Yeah. Okay, Monster Trucks is a movie from a while back. Creech lived in the truck's engine. All right, cool. All right. I haven't seen that one. Watch a lot of movies. Haven't seen that one. No, I haven't seen that one either. When I think of Monsters in Trucks, I think of the end of Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, I do too. And I'm always so sad that I never got any more. The Boom Studios one that Eric Powell wrote was actually pretty darn good, I gotta say. I have it, but I haven't read it. And I, I don't read it. And I don't generally like licensed comic books. No, I don't usually either. So but, but I like Eric Powell and he loves that stuff and he's got a very good if you've read any goon, oh yeah. That, he I brings like that it. sense of humor with it. That's perfect. Because and, I mean that's literally what that movie had, so yeah, and I, I, you know, I would be interested. I have not talked to Eric in, in years. Um, 
for no reason other than I just don't see him. Um, I saw him at San Diego um, the second year I was there when they were just mm. launching um, like Chimichanga and all of the creator owned books. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Hillbilly. Oh, and, Hillbilly was great. Um, yeah, and I didn't ask him about that because I would be curious to know if, if Boom, you know, gave him a lot of space to do stuff or if the licensor would ch changed anything or anything like that. I'm always curious to what that relationship is like and what f what changes from creative vision through the editorial and licensing process, because there's always ever anytime you have something like that, more people have their hands in the finished product than most people realize. Oh yeah. Well, when I, um, I almost got to do a dream project. Um, and, uh, I was actually told that I was too anime, so they didn't want me drawing it. Hmm. Um, Bummer. you know, I'll, I'll say that the company was, um, rhymes with Carvel hmm. and, um, has something to do with space wars and Lucasfilm. I just said it, but yeah, so they approved something for it. And, um, they were like, why don't you do it with this? And I was like, o okay. And it, 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 the creative change they wanted to make, I was just like, okay, <laughs> all for it. And I know some people that have worked on those books, uh, they, they flat out send them like uh, background ref and everything that they have to follow pretty strictly. I've heard, I've heard that's a pretty guarded intellectual property. So you're, you're not alone in having um, had requirements handed down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I had, I had no problem with what Lucasfilm wanted. They didn't have a problem with my art style. It was actually uh, the other guys who did, okay. specifically an editor. Yeah, they have a lot of say in what what ends up on the shelf. Yep, I think that's and, one of the reasons why uh, D Dubs has never gotten um, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson hasn't gotten a Star Wars book from Marvel. I mean, he's definitely a super fan. Well, and you know, and you know, with maybe that'll change because like his GI Joe, and I, again, not a fan of licensed comics. I picked it up because Daniel did it, and it was the the only issue that I've been able to find because it sells out um was terrific yeah i have all of his uh trans trans transformers. transformers he did transformers and then who was the other guy that does gi joe um that worked with sean gordon murphy and them yeah i know you're talking about uh, i, 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 I flip-flopped them but they're both at skybound um, yeah and daniel did uh transformers and it was just dynamite um, yeah i absolutely loved it jonathan yeah. here is the uh transformers expert in the room so oh excellent Oh. I remember watching the original cartoon. Matter of fact, they're going to be showing the first four episodes of it in theaters, um, I think in May. I rewatched, I, I actually went with a bunch of people to go see the Transformers movie in on the big screen in Providence oh, a, cool. few year, a few years back. And, you know, as, as much as I, I, I enjoy most of the catalog of... Um, uh, what's his name? Um, anyway, as much as I enjoy uh, those old movies and stuff, I I'll admit, like it was. It, first off, it's way darker than you remember, and then oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> super dark. Um, Orson Welles, you know, he, he, I enjoy most of his movies. I, I and he was a, he was an old man at that time. I just I didn't love the movie. I'm not gonna lie, didn't love That's it. Fair. Just seeing it as an adult, like I'm sure as, you know, and I, my brother was the Transformers guy. I was the Ghostbusters guy. That's fair. So. How many issues of Transformers did you get so far? I only have two. So I, I'm going to have to hit the, hit the eBay. Cause um, once I, once I have some money, I just had to pay my taxes. So I have to save, I have to save up for a little bit before I buy. I'm still working out that giant stack of comics I got at the, the Franklin show. Oh, that's fair. Hey, yeah, when you can I get have... two and $3 books in a big pile. Oh yeah, that works. My, um, my comic guy has all the issues for me. I think I only have issue one at home right now, but he's holding all the books for me. Nice. So just as I can afford to pay for them, so. 
Comics aren't cheap. No, they're not. But I wanted basically, I mean, I love Dan's stuff. Um, I actually got a piece of original artwork from his, uh, from Extremity recently um, that he sent me. And it's pretty damn cool. That is cool. I have it hanging up on my wall. Oh, it's actually next to the Dave Finch piece that I have. Uh, I have a picture of Raven that he did. And near my J. Lee piece. I've been looking for a vintage J. Lee piece. As much as I enjoy his new stuff, I don't know. I'm also looking for like that crazy, sketchy, like when he was doing uh, Submariner. Yeah, I was going to say when he was doing Namor. That stuff was great. Um, yeah. yeah, this is his uh, more recent as a uh, Wonder Woman piece, and it's beautiful. I, I just yes. uh, pure pure nostalgia for me. Oh yeah, no, I'm the same way. I love this uh, Namor stuff and things when he was getting when he was getting into the industry and breaking in. I mean, hell, I liked his uh, his Wildcats and um, Wildcats uh, trilogy. Oh, yeah, yeah, Wildcats trilogy, and then he did like Young Blood Strike File. I think he did like a Chapel story. And uh, I love those. I mean, it actually got me to buy Youngblood stuff. And then he did Hillshock. And then he did that X-Men annual as well. Yeah. Yeah, I like his stuff a lot. I think I'm responsible for both issues then. Yes, okay. I believe so, Jonathan. Excellent. And uh, Mike's saying uh, Transformer orders keep going up. Yeah, they do. It's supposed to be a very good series. I mean, the, the little bit I've read of it so far, I like it. So It's almost like if you hire talented people, good things happen. Yeah, it's weird. It's funny how that works. But yeah, I mean, and I'm, not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I would get an answer just because I don't know Daniel at all. Uh, but I would have the same question. like, cause, And because I would hope because it's Bob Kirkman that he basically was like, my editor major editorial stuff is in the hiring process. When I hire this artist, I'm not saying they have free reign, but I'm going to give them a lot of room to run. Mm. Yeah, Kirkman was on a um, was on one of Dave's streams, and I got to talk to him a little bit, which was kind of cool. Um, I said, "So you taking submissions?" And he's like, "No, not really." And I was like, "Damn." Tell him you want to do a revival of Battle Pope. Oh, that'd be hilarious. That would be utterly hilarious. And I just remember this character is supposed to have white hair. I hate it when I do that. Yeah, I first met Tony Moore in 03 somewhere in there the artist that he worked on that with and all those guys bob and azra and all them used to hang out on a forum called pencil jack I remember pencil jack so not desiree's gonna drop off it's nice seeing you desiree hey desiree you remember pencil jack pencil jack was good a lot of the a lot of people on there got uh got kind of noticed from that yeah, Mamad Azra, Ray Hyde, uh, my buddy Nate Lovett. Um, yeah, Nate's great. I love Nate's stuff. I hope he gets to do more of those because I think his art style is so perfect for it. More of those kids' golden books. Yeah, those are cool. Because he got he... to do that uh, D and D one. Yeah, because like between him and like Sean Galloway, they're like made for that kind of art style. <laughs> Well, yeah, and actually, um, yeah, Galloway was on there too. I think. Pencil yeah, Jack. he's done. He's done those before as well. Beautiful. Yep. Oh, I actually have to draw in the background still. Usually, I do a bit more of a rough of a background, but in this case, I didn't yet. Cue the organic shapes for the background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's supposed to be like in a grimy kind of warehouse kind of look to it that's been set up as like an arena so here's where I go in and try to do just a little bit of cleanup with my eraser 
Yeah, the other one I did, I did an ink wash. That was like, this person wanted, um, their description was like an episode, a, they gave a picture of a character from an old TOS Star Trek episode. Mm. And I basically was like, I don't do likenesses for this kind of thing. And uh, they were like, just do your interpretation of her getting ready for a fight in a like space arena. So like I had her like grabbing one of these weapons off the wall, going out to face off this other other person. So that is cool. I like that. It came out really good. Thanks. There's, there's some things I would tweak as always, but it was one of those where I um, I'm happier with the ink wash than I was with some of the, my structural stuff. Hmm. And it didn't, I don't know if it saved it, but it made it engaging enough for me to not redo it. That's fair. When you're doing your ink washes, what do you do? Just water down some India ink? Um, what I did, and, and people will probably laugh at me, um, but I got, I tried doing markers for years, and you know this, and I just wasn't mm -hmm. very good at them. Um, I was always better at painting. So what I did was, is I took three of these water brushes um, mm -hmm. and put, filled them with water. And I put like six drops of ink in one, like 20 drops of ink in another, and like 50 drops of ink in another. So I had three tones yeah, and cool. it functions more like a watery brush. Like I'm painting rather than like a marker, but it has the organization that you get from using markers. Yeah, I kind of like that. That's a, that's a cool idea. Um, I got a... Um... And vastly cheaper, and you can refill it infinitely. Yep. I got some... Um, it's funny. I have a bunch of um, stuff from um, model painting, and these are all basically shades and ink washes oh, for right. um, doing things with models. And, well, they work just fine using it on drawings, too. So. Oh, nice. I actually gave all of my uh, my markers, my giant box of markers, to Jay Kennedy when I when I when I when I, when I really threw in the towel. I was like, I don't even want these in my house anymore. <laughs> well then, that that's definitely making a statement. And it's, they're a good product. I just wasn't made for it. That's fair. Well, yeah. It was having to go over it again and again, again. and again to get like any sort of like tonal shifts and get rid of edges and stuff and even when they were brand new i had a hard time with it but with this i can do like one little twist and like a brush maneuver and it you know it works yeah, so that's uh those are all the different pots i have for different like ink washes so do you just know which them. ones which are they labeled they're labeled this one is um beel tan green i got reichland flesh shade this is Soul Blight uh, Gray. Uh, Drakenhof Nightshade. Um, Agrax Earthshade. Base Cortex White. That's actually a paint. Okay. Uh, uh, shade uh, Gnome, Gnome Oil. Then I have Seraphim's um, Sepia and Berserker Bloodshade. And this one is Cassandora Yellow, which looks kind of orange. I'm sure you're the same way. You'll try all kinds of new new stuff and see what works. Oh god, yeah. Yeah, now I um I also like working with a uh, color pencil and stuff like that. So, um, like I have my my um, oh, what the hell are they? They're um, can't think of the name of them. They're expensive. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think color pencils was a similar thing. Like uh, I think of an artist like. Clayton Henry, who can use them just so deftly and ge almost gently with the final product, and I just mm -hmm. mine looks like they're being hammered at by like a, a toddler when I when I mush the colors onto a piece of paper. Oh, yeah. The uh, again, uh, my friend Rob, uh, Rob uh, Donis, he he's amazing with um, colored pencils and stuff. 
I also have my Dr. Martin stuff. That stuff I'm okay with because it functions more or less like watercolor. I mean, you yep. you don't get you don't get as nice of a, a mix when you mix the colors, but um, yeah. Like, That's it. I got my watercolor too. Yeah. That's it. Polychromos. This is a color pencil stuff I use. Paper style, nice. Colors. And there's a big difference with colored pencils, like when you buy real ones, than when yeah. you use like the even. Uh, I even found that, that the Prismacolor ones were were okay, but not like again. You would even if you had a really smooth paper, you would still I would still be fighting um, trying to smooth it out. Yeah, I don't like the Prismacolor stuff. I love the Faber Castell stuff. I can do a lot of really neat things with it. So I'm um, happy with that. Then I also have um, a bunch of uh, Copics that are. I have like all the neutral grayscale Copics. So I do some stuff with those too. The pencils. Um, the, um, the markers. Markers, markers yeah. yeah. Where is it? Then? He's got a more exaggerated hat than even I. Never heard of any of these characters. Like, uh, this is Optimus Prime. That's uh, Copics on that. Oh, okay. Um, The sound wave appears to have vanished. Oh, there it is. That's the sound wave. Now I have like a cell shade when I do it with it, so I have fun with that. Then again, I like coloring and doing kind of a cell shade look to things. Yeah. Manga always tends to be in black and white, so that's one of the other things I like working while uh, I like manga. Coloring takes so much time. It really does, and it's just expected to, to just have it appear or, or pay someone to make it appear. It's hmm. one of the reasons I've been kind of saying myself more as a, an American mangaka. So, <laughs> building myself more in that way now. And I, I, I just love I love the black and white format. So yeah, same. whether it's whether you just use straight line art or if you do some extra cross hatching or however if you use some uh some zipatone or whatever. Oh I love zipatone. I even like working with classic zipatone. And hell, I like hand lettering my special effects. Yeah. Well it adds it it so often with, with lettering. Um, especially when I look at, again, looking at my own stuff, when I would use digital effects or any sort of font, it didn't, it looked like it was just sitting on top of it. It didn't look like it was a part of it, my artwork for me. So just yeah. adding, just knowing that it's from the same hand, even if you're referencing something, it's going to be a little different and it's going to fit the lines that you're putting down. Yep. Yes, yeah, so I've been getting more into doing hand lettering stuff. I mean, I I found my um my aims guide and I've been like, oh, nice. oh. And my friend Glenn is just like all about the classic uh, hand lettering. Like he does everything traditionally, and um, he's a great cartoonist and artist in his own right. In his right, but yeah, he just likes working everything classically and traditionally. I, 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 when I first started hand lettering again, I was using an Ames guide, but I found that again, it made me too tentative when I was doing, I was like, oh, I've got to be within these little things. And now what I do is I'll, I'll just use a ruler that is beveled and rule out. Mm. And then rather than doing the slants, I just do it by hand. And I, I find that even though it's not plumb, it definitely is better lettering. Yeah, no, I um, I can agree with that. Like, I'm using the Ames lettering guide with some stuff that I'm doing now just to kind of get a good feel for, like, a beginning. Um, I'm not. Oh, no, there, there, there are people that can make those things sing for sure. Again, this, yeah. these are just my own shortcomings. Oh yeah, no, I get it. I get it. Completely get it. 
Uh, I wish uh, more of the deleter tones would come to the U.S. I have seen only a tiny amount from U.S. Uh, resellers online. That's from Mike. Also, I've been using Faber-Castell pens and Pentel pocket brush pen uh, for my one-off pieces of art. Yeah, that definitely works. The, um, the, the, if you use Photoshop, the, if you go to the Creative Cloud, they now have a manga set of tools. And mm -hmm. I have looked at them, and they are very close to a lot of those deleter. Even if you, if you set your DPI to 400 and to the one of one print size, rather than trying to you know, do it at 11 by 17 or whatever and shrink it down, mm -hmm. and then you print it out, it looks very close. It's not exact. I'm not saying it's exact. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're not able to find something and you need an approximation, to experiment with, that's a good way to, to do it. Yeah, Clip Studio is also really good for um, for getting the screen tone look and everything as well. So yeah. then again, it is a Japanese product. And so, they've been doing it longer. Um, yeah. It used to be Manga Studio. Yep, it was. It was Clip Studio in Japan always. When they brought it over here, they called it Manga Studio. And then eventually they just renamed it to be Clip Studio Paint. A more marketable term, I guess. Yep. And they just put out their new version of it. Um, so thankfully, I already had like an upgrade plan in place, so I got it for free. That's nice. Yeah, and I'm having fun with it for what I use it for. I mean, I do it for like finishing things and stuff. Yeah. Like really going in. Uh, well, I was doing all my lettering in it. And there's plenty of people that use like the... Um, uh, I know Nate is a big fan of the perspective guides that they give you. For, oh, those um, are useful. Doing your backgrounds and stuff. Yeah, those are very useful. Granted, I have um, I have basically perspective um, guides that I can just light box over. So that's nice. I got a couple of um, basically perspective kind of ruler things that they have like the grid on them and everything, so I can just light box it and then figure out where things are and kind of go from there. There's an antique tool that I've been looking for where it actually it looks like two arms. And what it does is instead of having two rulers that connect like 30 feet off your table, mm -hmm. it will allow you to set your vanishing point with like two little arms and then you can pull it around and it functions and it keeps that vanishing point. And they, they haven't made this tool in like 60 years. And I've been looking at antique stores. I've been looking online. But yeah, that's something I've been looking for, for like a hand tool that would save me days of my life yeah that sounds um kind of useful i mean and i won't be eyeballing as much so it's like yeah. less frustrating i mean i can fake perspective but it's usually better when i actually lay out a grid so <sighs> or it's like you know actually working with rulers and stuff oh i still have my like you know six foot metal ruler floating around here but yeah, I, I got one around here too, someplace. Leaning yeah. in the corner. Yeah. And then when you need a second one for the vanishing point, it's like taping other rulers together. It's yep. always fun. That's a, the that's a, that's a classic way of doing it. We got, oh, and Mike's like, avoiding the Amore in, in Final Print Comics uh, is an issue I have been trying to find an answer to. Yeah, the Amore effect can definitely get annoying. I mean, the first the first rule is just to not have two screens together. Like that's yep. the first rule. It will always create a moray pattern. And then, yep. depending on how you scale it, that can also create a moray pattern because it can throw your dots um, out of proportion or put too little space between them, even though they were right. You know, when they were full size or whatever. Yep. Yeah, you gotta um, you base the like I know with Clip Studio, you base the moray, you base the dot size on. Um, the reduction size. Yep. Like you yep. take the one that they have that's like set for the size you're going to reduce it to, and you use that one for your um, when you put everything in. So it might look a little funny when you're doing it uh, there, but when it actually prints out and everything, it'll look right. Yep. Totally right. We're gonna we're gonna cheat and use simple. Large moon framing device. Mm. This is cheating, folks. Yeah, it's definitely cheating. It's cheating. It's kind of like 
it's like, oh, what goes down there? That's where the smoke goes. But don't you draw feet? That's where the smoke goes. And the rocks. Granted, I'm drawing feet, but still. I've got two sets of feet. One being very cartoony looking because this character kind of looks like kind of looks like bone. Yeah, it does kind of. I like it though. And you got like McGruff the crime dog in the back there. Yeah, I don't know. He's like green. He's got a hat yeah. on. That's actually kind of cool. I like that. Yeah, and then you got the little guy there who's kind of like bone. He's even dressed kind of like bone. Yeah. I think they have a hat on with a little bow. Yeah. They have, um, so I think it's, um, phony bony is kind of what they look more like with the jacket. But yeah. It doesn't look quite as deranged as whenever I'm asked to draw Sonic the Hedgehog. That's fair. <sighs> The stuff of nightmares. Well, and there's probably like 20 of them out there that I've done. And they were all from free comic book days doing them for people. Uh, always kids. Yep. Uh, and they just, that's the only comic they like. So here's yep. your terrifying Sonic young person. Yeah, I would never forget. What was that? We were at one of the, um, the Knights of Columbus shows in Attleboro. And um, kid came up to me and he's like, can you draw like Kirby and Yoshi or something together on a, you know, like doing like a fighting thing or something? Or it was like Mario and Yoshi or something. And I'm pretty sure it was like Kirby and Yoshi. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, yeah, I can do that. And like, you know, I went and did it. And you're just like, I'm so glad she got that one. <laughs> yes, a thousand percent. And I, I, I am not egotistical to where if there is someone better than me at something that I'm like, please take it over to, you know, for robots, take it over to Frankie Washington or, oh, God, um, yeah. you know, or Casey um, Collier, um, the Transformers artist. It's like, yeah. please take it to them. <laughs> I, I think that some of them do it because I've, I must have a reputation where they're like, we just want to see him miserable. There was, oh. there was one time I was sitting across from a very lovely, kind nice artist who does mouse guard named david peterson david peterson's great he's super just nice. a lovely human being and yep. this person badgered him into drawing him like a harley quinn for his sketchbook and he didn't want to do it he's like no i'd rather not I'll, I'll draw you any mouse you want basically and he just was miserable for like and it's because he was just artistically not satisfied with what he was putting down and he didn't really want to do it but he didn't want to disappoint this fan and he was doing what he you know, he was being a nice guy, um, yep. but it just, I could clearly see that struggle across from me. And I just, it's one of those where we saw each other and knew that we sh knew what was happening. Oh God. Yeah. And I, I felt bad for him, but like, it was, it was a stand up moment of just like, I'm just trying to make the fans happy. So I'm going to try to draw this Harley Quinn. Yeah. That's, um, that's very Dave Peterson. I mean, I've been on some of his live streams hanging out in the background and stuff, but he's a super nice guy. And then I've had people ask me for likenesses of like, you know, like something that someone at the show is already offering. Like, uh, you know, uh, th there's so many artists in the area that do like caricatures as superheroes or... You know, like Scott Hamilton was here for years and years. He's moved mm -hmm. away, but yeah. there's like a handful of other people that do it now too. And I would always be like, no, no, they're right over there. They're, they'll, they'll be happy to do that for you. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was actually one guy who was contacted me before a show, asked me to draw his families as superheroes. And I just politely said, no, thank you. And he was basically like, yeah, but I'll give you money. And I was like, no, thank you. I'd rather just not, you know, deal with that. And, the expectations that are of like the expectation is, is you're going to make them look like the most awesome they've ever looked in their lives. Yep. And no, I, I would have passed on that one too. I just respect. And I had done one in the past and I didn't like it and they didn't like it. And that was just like enough for me. Like if, if you, if you're cool with a caricature that isn't particularly nice, then I'll give it a shot. But that doesn't mean I'm intentionally being mean, but you just got to be like, I'm up for whatever's coming out of your pen, you know? Yeah, pretty much. I get that.
Uh, let's see. I don't use microns anymore. If you know anyone locally who wants a bunch of them, I can mail them out to you. Mike, I'll take them all. There you so, go. I can always use more microns. That's what I ink all my mechanical stuff in my backgrounds with. I've been trying to go to a broader line, and I was considering, I was goofing off today, and I was considering doing, because I use it for prelims, just doing a short story just in flares. No, well, that could be kind of cool. I have, some, uh, I have some Sharpies that uh, um, for stuff. They're actually archival Sharpies. Oh, cool. I don't that think are, I've ever seen those. Yeah, and they're like they're they're set up like the flare pens. Oh wow. Are they more expensive than like your regular Sharpie? No, no, they're pretty cheap. Actually, again, that was something that uh Rob turned me on to. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I get well, I got a bunch of weird art tools from him. Uh I don't have my crow quill under here, but that's something else I I often I think it's in my uh, my art bag. But that's something else I do mechanical stuff with. Yeah. I forgot a Faber Castell pen to be incredible black and archival pigment. I never really attached to microns, and when I found an alternative, I quickly stopped using them. Okay. Oh, found. Yeah, that makes much more sense. Yeah, I've used the pit pens for yeah, years. Yeah, the pit pens are good. Actually, I have a bunch of them. Yep. Yeah, no, I like the Faber Castell pit pens. I actually got like the last set that they had at a Michael's one time. So there's a there's a size that that they make, uh, Michael, uh, called the FH. It is a flexible head, and you cannot get them in the states. I had to order them from Europe, and they will not sell them individually. So I actually had to buy a set to get one because it's what Kyle Hotz uses. It's what a handful of other artists use. And mm -hmm. I was like, I just want to try it. And it probably cost me like $25 or so just to try this pen, but it's amazing. And if they made them more accessible, I would use more of them. But FH is the size. Oh, um, the ones you're talking about. I think I've seen yours. Yeah. And they're kind of the closest approximation are these. These are the um, Kiritaki ones. And it's got yeah, a flexible yeah. head. But the yeah, Faber Castell one isn't like markery, it's like plastic. So it's got a little bit sharper edge. But yeah. Yeah, I have a bunch of those I got on jet pens. <gasps> and see, I wish jet pens would have the FH, but they do not. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I got the, the pen you're just showing the Karatakis and all that. That's the Tombow ones also. I did try something that David Finch suggested the, the Pasca pens. Oh, I have a bunch of those. Pens. And yeah. I, I just didn't, they didn't do, either. again, it could be user error and i wholly admit that that could be true but when i was trying to use them on pages like i still found that i had to go over it a couple times it was a little translucent mm. oh you have a pit fh there cool. you go that's that's the money pen right there you got it from jet pens did you have to buy it in a set or did you buy it by itself i mean if they have the set I, next time I need to order a bunch, I would just order one of those sets. But I was hoping that there would be a place that you could buy it, like a one-off. Yeah, that'd be kind of handy. And I ain't asking for free. I'm happy to pay for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm happy to pay for that stuff myself. I mean, good, good art supplies is good art supplies. Yeah. Uh, ooh, rain's starting to come down. Yeah, it was pouring when I was uh, driving this afternoon. Yeah, I got home from my mom's like just before the rain really started kicking a bit. So I was definitely happy about that. Going with the Wally Wood um, idea, when in doubt, black it out. Yep. This character does not have a, it has a, he has a, it looks like he has a big chin, but he doesn't have a tick chin. So I have to try to not go too curve far it. in that direction. Yeah. Curve it out more. Yeah. That muscle memory. 
It's yeah, strong. I was gonna say, I'm like, I'm gonna say, I'm like, I can see that turning to the tick very easily. The tick's got a very um, noticeable chin. It's like uh, the Bruce Campbell of chins could kill. A fantastic book, which I have a. Oh yeah, I love that book. Was it Tales of a Bee movie actor or something? A story either, of a bee either movie tales actor. or confessions. I don't yeah, remember. I think it was Confessions of a Bee movie actor. That's right. And we came so close to having Bruce Campbell as the Phantom. That would have been great. Much as much as we all love Billy Zane, let's let's be fair here. As far as like cult status goes, if Bruce Campbell played the Phantom. Yeah, that would have been amazing. Such a weird character. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying there, it's like it's like McGruff the crime dog. Yeah. It's not. And I don't mean that as an insult. <laughs> Good. We got, we got 10 folks in here right now. So hello, everyone. Hey, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great night I'm watching us doodle. Miss Jason. Uh, yeah, he said he was working. Oh, no, that makes sense. Yeah. I always tell people, if it, you know, like you can check out Jay's work, but the crazy thing is, is like he just has stacks of pages just at home. He's like, oh, it's just an exercise. Yeah, it sounds Un like that. Unpublished piles of pages. Oh, I have tons of stuff like that. Hell, I have several books I've done that I've never went and tried publishing or whatnot. I just drew them. Yeah, I think if I ever, you know, I've had a couple of issues have to sit on a shelf for a long time and i have one i'm currently i did get a phone call not that long ago about it but it's just been sitting there for like two years if if i had a, a self-published anything or like that i owned completely i don't know it, it would it would take have to take something very important or convincing to not do something with it even if it was just literally like posting it on my website mm. Yeah, some of the stuff I did was more like an exercise and um, just getting something out of my system that I wasn't really sure I wanted to share. So yeah, that's totally fair. I just like this stuff I'm sharing because I want to eventually publish it. So yeah. Yeah, doing the Undersea Hero stuff as I've been making it, that's kind of been like my first foray into like putting that much unfinished and process work out. And, and people, in spite of what publishers and editors have told me, oh, you can never, you can never, never put out unfinished work. People seem to really like it, uh, seeing the process. So, yeah, you know, I, I have maybe in the long run, I'll find a reason to regret it. But so far, it's been nothing but a positive thing. Yeah, no, I've always um I've always found my work in progress stuff usually gets more likes than the finished artwork and things. So. Really? Yeah. Those people love seeing like the work in progress stuff and how it work comes how it comes together. Yeah. <sighs> well, we have passed the nine thirty mark. Yes, we have. I think I'll be wrapping it up for the most part. Um, wrapping up? You're not going to ten? Nah, because five thirty comes early. Oh, that's a that that's that's true. I can yeah. I can respect that. Yeah, so I, I hop off here. I finish putting stuff together if I got to do anything for for the morning, so I don't have to stagger around. Um, but um, thank you, Allison, for coming and hanging out. It was absolutely wonderful having you on. 
I love coming out and hanging out with you. And, Definitely uh, gonna uh, do this again. I mean, as I said, whenever I'm not gaming, I would love to hang out. So. Yeah, any anytime you you feel up for it, it's it's a it's a pleasure. And uh, yeah. the page is coming along nicely. Big action shot in the middle. So, mm. yep. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for coming by, and um, hopefully next Wednesday we will see you. Um, we'll see you then. Sounds good. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Night. Bye. Bye.